So good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk today about anorexia nervosa. Um, I'm afraid it, we won't have a huge amount of time to go into all the detail, but I'll try to just give you an overview. And of course, if anybody wants to contact me in the future, they know where I am. I work in Temple Street on the mental health liaison team. So we'll just talk about just the, initially the definition for anorexia nervosa. Um, it's characterized by determined attempts to lose weight or to avoid weight gain, either by a young person restricting their food intake, self-induced vomiting, lax of abuse or excessive exercise, or a combination of one or more of these. Due to our age group that we see here in Temple Street, we don't see so much of the lax of abuse, but certainly the restricting food intake and at times the self-induced vomiting and definitely the excessive exercising. Um, with anorexia nervosa, adolescents' perceptions of body weight can change dramatically with the disorder. And even those who have a very low weight perceive themselves as being overweight. So that's just more about the definition of anorexia. And I, you can access the slides afterwards and it's all there. So there's huge associated cognitions with anorexia and an awful lot of the young people who have it will deny that they have this intense fear of um, being fat, but that is what they really, really fear when they have the illness. And I suppose just to demonstrate um, a young person how they feel with anorexia. So say this is the young person, right? If you're looking at me in the screen, this is the young person and this is anorexia nervosa. And it really kind of takes the young person over. And sometimes that's hard for nurses to understand when they're working with the young person on the ward because they, they feel, oh, why won't this child eat? And I'm sure you've all thought that, but in fact, they can't. And usually if they're admitted to the hospital, they're very, very ill and their, their brain is starved and they very much have distorted thinking and they're not able to listen to what we say when they come into hospital. So we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go along. So it's just some facts about anorexia nervosa. Distorted body image, as I've just said, is a central issue in an eating disorder, even if the child is admitted in the beginning. And often there may be a comorbid depression as well. So as well as the anorexia nervosa, there might be depression or obsessive compulsive disorder or self-harm present as well. You can see the prevalence there. And the thing is during COVID that there was a 66% increase in the numbers of young people presenting to um, the pediatric hospitals here in Dublin with anorexia nervosa. Um, and there's a paper on that, Dr. Barrett and Dr. Sarah Richardson from Crumlin um, published a paper on that. So why, why does anorexia nervosa happen? And it's really important to say here is that the causes, the definite causes of anorexia nervosa are unknown. There's no single reason that anorexia nervosa develops in a young person. And you'll get young people when they present, their parents will blame themselves. Parents are not at fault. The young person is that not at fault. It's really important that nurses um, understand that. So there's a list there of the um, factors that can contribute to a young person developing anorexia, but there's no single reason why one child develops an eating disorder. So it's an interaction of factors and it can include all those things there, temperament, life events, societal pressures, that culture of thinness and um, all those things there stress emotions so as you can see there things come together genetic plus the social environmental factors can come together to equal a perfect storm and the development of disorder and it can be insidious it, you don't know what until it's really on top of you it's it's eating away at the young person and they're gradually restricting restricting until suddenly well it's not sudden at all but it can appear sudden to parents that they appear very sick and it often occurs during adolescence and that's a time when teens are normally starting to develop independence so it can go unnoticed okay so their presentation of these young people with anorexia it's usually via the emergency department it's hardly ever a planned admission and the young person never wants to come to hospital they never want to go to the doctor they want to stay with their anorexia nervosa and keep um, playing by the an anorexia nervosa's rules and restricting their intake and that's really all they can think about so they never very few never really do they want to come and um, themselves but the parents bring them often because they've had maybe a bit of a faint or somebody has said oh my goodness and um, mary looks you know very very unwell but it's often because they 
the parents have been trying and trying to get them to eat and they just can't. Um, so the parents are always very shocked and upset, particularly when they get to ED and if the young person has to be admitted that they have to be told how physically ill they are because they see their young person and they think, well, they're walking and talking, they're going to school, how bad can it be? But in fact, often these young people under their skin are very, very ill. So initially they have a medical review in ED and junior marzipan has been a great breakthrough in, um, and I just go forward here now for a second to the um, junior marzipan here. It's the medical risk assessment for the management of really sick patients under the age of 18. And it's a really, really important document that we use now for the past few years in, in all the pediatric hospitals and CHI. And it, 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 it measures all these um, things that are listed here on the um, on the page here, like percentage medium BMI, recent weight loss, heart rate and uh, the BP, ECG, their hydration status, all those things. So it gives a very good picture to know whether the young person needs to be admitted or not to the hospital. Um, so that's, sorry, I'll just go back there. So either they're sent home and linked in with the community team or they're admitted and we see them in the hospital here in Temple Street. So we know that the young person before they come in has to have tended to withdraw from peer relationships because they just want to be with their eating disorder. They want that they want to be as thin as they can be and um, they strive for perfection. They're usually very particular about schoolwork and often can display a marked preoccupation with food, talking about it, preparing it for others, but not eating it themselves. And as a result of all this, they often become very dependent on their parents because it's their parents have that unconditional love for them and won't question them too much because they don't want to upset them, where their peers will question them why they're not eating lunch and all those things. So the medical consequences that show up, some of them in the junior marzipan um, document, but also when they come into hospital and get the full medical workup, it's all there. And we don't have time to go through it all today, but um, mainly, I suppose, the thing is that the young person, their brain is starved, it hasn't had enough nutrition, so they can't take on the, the dangers of anorexia nervosa when they come into hospital, they can't take on how seriously ill they are. And what we have to keep telling them is giving them the facts about their physical state. Um, and things like tiredness, if you ask them, have they been tired, they will say no. And they don't actually realize that till they've had nutrition for a couple of weeks in hospital, they can look back and they can say, well, actually, I was very tired, but I didn't realize it then. So these are all the medical consequences of anorexia. And there's a lot there, you know, the electrolyte imbalance, needing obviously very regular bloods, amenorrhea in girls, the stomach ache or constipation that young people with anorexia constantly complain of because their tummy has shrunk down to that where maybe it, sh it should be like that. So all these things are very much understandable, but for the young person, they don't understand it. So when the young person comes into hospital, the inpatient management involves a multidisciplinary team here in Temple Street. Um, so involved, you have the pediatrician, you've got the psychiatrist, you've the dietitian, you've the, the nursing staff and the ward, hugely important, obviously, and you've the CNS on the mental health team, and you've mental health social work that we have here in Temple Street, and we all work together to work with the family. Um, within Temple Street, also we have um, a guideline. And we also it's also in Crumlin and Intala, the three teams from a team from each of the mental health team from each of the three hospitals worked together a, a few years back on the acute management of the pediatric patient with AN um, anorexia nervosa. So that's available for all nurses working in the three um uh, pediatric hospitals and I've just shown a list of it there when you get the slides you can you can look it up and I'm sure it's on the website if, in CHI as well so it should be accessible and it's an excellent document. When a young person comes into hospital they go on a meal plan and um, because food is their medicine and um, the refeeding guidelines are very important the dietitian and the pediatrician manage that but I've just put in a slide there for you to read at a later date. Very important that they're monitored, the young person. So from a behavioural point of view, usually the parents have a notice because the children have been wearing baggy clothes and they've been 
exercising, they over exercise and maybe going for very long walks, jogging for long periods, much more than before. But in busy households, sometimes that's not noticed and that's very understandable. And um, there's a list of behavioral things there psychological effects of anorexia nervosa and there they are there and um, often the young person can the parents will report that they've been feeling sad less interest in activities you know where previously they would have been maybe happy-go-lucky young people that they get moody and they cry quite a lot and particularly when food is around and often the parents don't understand what it is which is totally understandable for, you know because they wouldn't know but actually um it's the young the anorexia that is um, you know, willing the young person not to eat and finding any way they can to not eat. Um, the withdrawal from friends we talked about and maybe family, maybe young people don't want to go and visit their granny or their aunt that they previously would because they will notice that they've lost weight and they'll say it. Um, often they're quite irritable, difficult concentration because they're lacking nutrition and it also change in sleep passion because of the lack of um, nutrition and their preoccupation with the eating disorder thoughts. Um, Okay, and there's some more psychological, just a list there as well. Some of it is the same. Differential diagnosis, very important as nurses to mention here. And again, you will understand all those there and why they're differential diagnosis. We don't have time to go through them today. So the treatment for anorexia nervosa is medical stability. So, and often people will ring the liaison team and said, oh, there's a child in need. ED. Not so much now, but before we had the very structured um, response to a child with a possible eating disorder presenting TD, or will you come and see them? Talking, the first line for a young person presenting with um, um, anorexia nervosa is medical stability. They need to become medically stable. And the only way to do that is with food. So, um, counseling um is not or you know one-to-one -one psychotherapy is not the initial treatment for a young person with anorexia nervosa so the the overall treatment is medical stability weight restoration a meal plan from the dietitian assessment by the dietitian meal support in the in the sense context of one-to-one -one special observation where meals come on time they've three meals four snacks every day for a a certain amount of time and they have supervision whether by a one-to-one -one special observer or by the parents and um, parental support is is huge extremely important because it's the parents who will bring the child home um, and they're central to the young person's recovery and the message at all times is food is the medicine and um, where other young people break their leg they have to come in to have surgery People, young people have diabetes, they have to come in to have their meals, their insulin be trained up. For a child with anorexia, food is what they need to have to, to get them back to health. Um, so recovery from an eating disorder begins with weight restoration and normalization of eating, as we said. And um, in a manner of state, a child is not well enough for individual counselling. So Wong have a really good nursing care plan and engaging the adolescent takes time. And it's not about, you know, the nurse or the, the clinician on the team. And um, the young person often presents with ambivalence and resistance to treatment. The nurse will need to work with this resistance rather than against it. And um, communication between nurses for the plan on the ward is extremely important because the young person, because of their anorexia, it's not the young person. I try to separate the young person from the anorexia. It does take them over but you've, we're trying to pull the anorexia back from the young person. So the anorexia in the young person will try to send things back with the meal plan. I don't like that. I want brown bread. I want white bread. And the meals will get, will get all mixed up. You've got to have high communication between nurses where everybody sticks to the plan, which should be available for all to see on the ward. You've got to acknowledge the difficult road for the young person, but not change the plan. And um, we give facts about the potential effects of starvation to the young person and their families, the complications that can occur. We present the facts, but in not in a reward. Sometimes I hear people saying, oh, they've lost their privileges or we can reward. That is not a good practice around the treatment of anorexia. It's you can have a shower when you have the energy to have a shower. So it's to do with the child having enough energy for anything. It's not to do with us saying, you know, you can or you can't. It's all to do with the medical stability of the child. And it's like if a child can't take their meals and it's just too hard for them with the anorexia. 
then we might introduce an NG tube, but it's not because you can't eat, we're giving you this. It's we know it's very hard for you to eat. You are very sick. You have this condition. You have this illness. It's not your fault. It's not your parents' fault. And this is what we're going to do to support you. So it's how we, you know, phrase things to young people. It's very important um, to remember that and always discuss the rationale for the care plan. And I show the young people their clinical observations when they say, Carol, I don't need to be here. I'm taking up a bed in this very busy hospital. And I say, well, look, you need to be here as much as any other young person. There's your heart rate. There's your blood pressure. There's your temperature. And you're dizzy. And when you get out of bed, you can't stand, you know. So you just say the facts and, you know, eventually, you know, eventually they will understand. So it involves, you know, it, 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 nursing these young people and their families involves the process of emotional containment and it's complex and challenging. And, you know, there are skills required there and I think they're very good. You can read them again. And it's all about sharing our expertise, collaborating with the parents and having the boundaries and following the plan. And even though it's hard sometimes, having the parents on board is extremely important. Mealtime guidance for young people with anorexia nervosa. There's, there's a good bit of um, guidance there. It's a very difficult time. They need to be well planned. We need to follow the plan, calm, reassuring, and consistent manner. And we need to be compassionate with the young person, but we don't negotiate things like the meal plan or the, you know, the care plan. Um, um, it, I'm just looking down here. Avoid detailed discussions about food likes and dislikes during meal times. And um, you know, refocus the conversation. We can discuss that later because if a child is talking, they're not eating. And um, now start on your potatoes. Sometimes you need to give quite um, direct um, support around um, you know continuing within the time of the meal plan. And um, you might notice eating disorder behavior, like delaying the meal cutting up things very small, leaving lots of crumbs on the place, eating very slowly, hiding or dropping food. The young person needs to be called out on that in a very compassionate way. Um, and, you know, if a child is trying said that I'm finished and there's lots of crumbs on the place, we would bait, we would say, give them a spoon and say, scoop them up and have them. You know, you just, you're just factual business as usual approach, fair, but firm or firm, but fair. Um, giving clear, gentle and uh, firm prompts. I know this is, hard for you but you need to start now and um, please start the potatoes now keep going pick it up and eat it all those very direct um um directions i suppose yeah to to supporting a young person and we do that training with the parents as well so this is the care plan that we use in temple street um I, some of it i've spoken about there and um, young people using the bathroom before their meal and off for an hour afterwards Meal, meal time has been very well timed and the food is taken away when they're finished so they're not going into the next meal all those things all things you're probably aware of already and they're things that when you get the slides you can talk about um, or you can you can look up and um, one-to-one -one special observation guidelines uh, to be used in conjunction with the care plan and that's about establishing report professional boundaries supervision and safety meal times and recording everything the child's offered and everything the child eats and then active listening um, and that's all in our one-to-one -one special observation guidelines which again i'm sure are up on the website um, for chi and um, they're on cupels here in temple street and i'm sure they can be found um, and there's a report sheet for care staff as well who are especially young people because they can't write in the nursing notes and it just means that you're capturing all the information and you're not losing everything so um, family-based approach, that's very important um, for the young person when they leave the hospital and go to the community. Um, so the Maltese did loads of um, research uh, many years ago, and what the results showed that younger patients improved with family therapy more than with individual therapy. So parents within the family-based approach, the FBT therapy, are seen as the most use useful resource in the treatment of the adolescent. And James Locke is, this is an excellent book, and this is um, a manualized program for FBT. And um, James Locke wrote that book and it's absolutely excellent. And it's followed in CAMS and also here if we have young people who um, attend the hospital on an ongoing basis with anorexia. So it's a three phase process, um, FBT, refeeding the patient, and then just getting the young person back on the, right road to development because obviously the development has been stopped really by the anorexia nervosa and then um, the third phase is adolescent issues and discharge 
Um, so remember, weight restoration and normalizing eating patterns are at the core of the treatment process. And before anything else can happen, physical health has to be stabilized and parents have to be able to feed their child when they go home. I do some individual work and my colleagues do some individual work with this book. It's a really good workbook for doing just some a psychoeducation with the young person with anorexia two or three weeks after their admission when their brain is working again and when they can actually discuss things. And um, it's just psychoeducation and it's, it's very, very good. And um, so the most important thing is pulling together. And this includes, you know, obviously the parents and the young person. And we'd have weekly MDTs in Temple Street um, with the full team and the parents. And then the young person would join as they're improving just to make sure that everybody's on the same page and we're all um, following the plan and supporting each other and um, there's a limited role for medication in the treatment of um, anorexia nervosa but we do use it sometimes um, and we use SSRIs where there's a cl clinical evidence of depression and very um, rarely we use low dose neuroleptics and um, just to address that kind of severe obsessional thinking where the young person really can't eat and is really 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 anxious around food but it's very rare we use it but it it's only for, or for a few days if we do, and it can be very helpful in those situations. Um, okay, so the prognosis for the young person with, um, and this is why we have to be, you know, really put our best into treating them when they come to the paediatric hospital to us, because um, the, it's best for those diagnosed at an early age before abnormal eating patterns and other weight loss techniques are established and emaciation sets in. For many, it's a lifelong problem. Approximately 25% make a full recovery. 50% improve substantially, but may relapse under times of stress. And that's why the psychoeducation for the young person is quite important, because they need to be able to recognize that as they get, you know, when they get older, maybe leading cert or college exams. The first thing for them to go would probably be the eating. They'll probably start restricting because they're predisposed to it and they've, you know, they've had the illness before and they need to know what to do to get help immediately if that happens. And 25% um, do poorly. And you can see there um, deaths attributable to malnutrition, cardiac arrest or suicide. And it's a life threatening illness with one of the highest mortality, rate, mortality rates of any psychiatric disorder. And that's why it's so important to put our heart and soul into treating these young people when they, they come to hospital. So these are just some, um, there's no time to play videos now in this presentation, but it, it, Kelty Mental Health have excellent um, videos on um, meal support for young people and hearing young people's after recovery, what they felt like, okay? So they're the four C's of meal support, calm, comfortable, consistent, compassionate. And these are um, support um you can give parental support or nurse, you know, to read yourselves. They're excellent, um, excellent uh, resources for you to look up.